Hi, people. Oh, come on. Hi, people. Woo! Hi, my name is Dr. Jessica Kriegel, and you're my people because I grew up in tech, and I don't always get to talk to a lot of tech conferences, so this is a special treat for me, and maybe for you too, because a lot of my stories are tech stories, and so I hope they will enthrall and entertain you. Well, we're going to talk about culture. Does that sound good? So I need everyone to get up so we can do a trust fall. Just kidding. This is not that keynote. We're not going to talk about trust falls or kumbaya circles. This isn't an emotional keynote about how to do the right thing so that you can love your employees. And No, we're going to talk about the culture equation, which is how you leverage culture to drive results. Does that sound good? Oh, come on. Does that sound good? Okay, thank you. It's just, you know, a lot of pressure up here. I need some feedback. So let me start by sharing with you some data about the state of culture. Every quarter we publish a state of culture report, and one of the ones that we frequently, Gen Z, these are like millennials on steroids, right? <laughs> Gen Z is just, I'm a millennial. We were the best generation, right? Thank you. Come on, millennials, the best generation. No? Okay. So. What are the employee expectations now for Gen Z? What are we going to do about this? I'm going to tell you a story about when I first entered the workforce. That's me like 15 years ago, 20 years ago. I don't even know. This was right after I got my first job. That was my manager. I was working at Taleo. Anyone at Taleoite? Remember Taleo a long time ago? Yeah. Acquired by Oracle shortly thereafter. I was so happy. I had landed my dream gig. I was the most enthusiastic employee Taleo had ever seen. I mean, it was beyond my wildest dreams. I had graduated from my MBA. It was 2008, so do math about when that was. And I got a job, first of all. That was amazing, because it was 2008, right? And I got a job in Silicon Valley, and at a tech company, and I was training, and I was getting to do my favorite thing. And so I was just eager beaver, constantly trying to get involved in projects, and how can I be a part of this strategic initiative, and how can I do better? And after a year, I got my very first performance evaluation, which I was so excited about, because it was like, Corporate stuff, you know? Yay! And so I got my performance evaluation. I sat down ready to re receive all of my accolades. And the woman said, you know, Jessica, you're just like one of those millennials. You just need to bake a little bit longer. I was like, excuse me? I'm horribly offended. I have no idea what that means, but I hate you and I hate this. And I was the first quiet quitter. I invented quiet quitting. This was back in 2009. It wasn't even a trend then. I called it going dark. I literally labeled it. I said, I'm going dark. Screw those people. I asked for more feedback. She said, you know, you're like one of those kids that sits in the front of the classroom constantly raising their hand saying, pick me, pick me. It's kind of annoying. We'd like you to just back off. <laughs> I was so irritated. So I went dark. But I still had all this energy, so I applied to school. I went to Drexel, I got my doctoral degree in human resources development, and in your doctoral program, you have to write a dissertation, and they say, pick a topic that you're really passionate about, because you're gonna be reading everything about this topic and writing about it for the next year, you cannot get bored. And I said, okay, great, I'm gonna write about millennials, because when I hold a grudge, I hold a grudge, okay? <laughs> You want to tell me I've got to bake? Well, I'm going to research everything about millennials so that I can, I don't even know what the plan was. It was just anger, right? It was like resentment manifesting in a career path. So <laughs> here I was doing all this research, and I really loved the data science of it. I got so into understanding what was truth and what was misconception, what was reality, what was anecdotal information, what was real data science, and so I got really passionate about this. And the millennial thing became my first book. It was fascinating. I got to start my keynote career talking about generational truths and lies. But what I really felt passionately about was leadership. And I wanted to understand the data science of leadership and culture. What actually makes a great leader? So I studied this thoroughly, and I got the answer. So I'm going to share it with you. Are you excited? You want to be a great leader? What is the one thing that all good leaders have in common? The one thing that is universally true for every good leader?
their followers? No. They get results, okay? That's literally the definition of a leader. Come on, that was kind of a joke. Nobody laughed. Good leaders get results. That's bottom line. You can be a humble leader. You can be a transparent leader. You can be a hard-driving leader. You can be a detail-oriented leader, a bureaucratic leader, a whatever leader. Good leaders get results. That's the bottom line. If you're not getting results, you will not be considered a great leader. So the question is, how do you become the leader that gets results? And I think the answer is culture. Does anyone else think the answer is culture? <laughs> nah. I'm not going to force you to clap for that one. I want you to authentically express your opinion about the matter. And I don't blame you. A lot of people aren't sure. We're going to answer that question. Does culture actually drive results? And there are two leadership camps on culture. And we saw that kind of play out in that m measly applause that we heard. The one is the leader who's like, nah. I literally heard someone over here go, nah. Right? That's that camp. Those are the people who are focused on execution, on operationalizing, on scaling, on we got to get results. The performance people, those are the people that are constantly talking in sports metaphors, right? I say that with love. And then there's the other camp of culture who are the culture believers. They believe that it is a powerful tool to drive results. They may or may not actually understand how. They may, have ne may or may not actually have seen that work in action, but they're like, yeah, there's something to culture. If only I could crack that code, but I'm chink. If only I could actually understand what the equation was to get l culture to drive results. So we're going to speak to both camps. We're going to pretend like you guys are the culture disbelievers and you guys are the culture believers, okay? So to the people who are skeptical over here, let's talk about the data. First of all, Harvard Business did this uh, study 30 years ago. It was with Cotter. If you know anything about this field, Cotter is a legend, right? And he wanted to understand, does culture actually drive results? And he was looking at real measurable results, revenue growth, et cetera. And he looked at 20 firms with weak culture, 12 firms with strong culture, and found, yep, significant growth, significant business results when you focus on having a strong culture. Sounds great. The problem was it didn't answer why, and the other problem is that's 30 years old, and there's only 32 companies in the sample size. So we wanted to recreate and better this research. So I partnered with Stanford, and we created a study of 243 organizations, large organizations mostly, and we looked at three years of data. We looked at their strategy, their revenue, we looked at their purpose, we looked at their culture, we looked at everything around how this organization operates for all 243, and we came out with two big insights, okay? Number one, we validated that strong culture does drive revenue to the tune of 4X. Companies with weak culture, they had average revenue of 10%. Companies with strong culture, 42.2%. So that was good news. We're on the right track. But then we wanted to answer the question, but how? Why? Like, what's the differentiator? And this was key insight number two. There was only one culture type significantly correlated with increased revenue growth. Does anyone want to guess what that might be? What's that winning culture? Detail-oriented, collaborative, could be transparent, could be customer service-oriented, right? Innovative. Anyone? Shout something out. The answer is an adaptive culture. The ability to adapt was the number one differentiator for driving results, again, to about 3x, right? So all of these commonly espoused cultures, collaborative, results-oriented, customer-oriented, great. That average growth over three years was 17%, not bad. But an adaptive culture, oops, was 49%. So that's 3x. So you can have whatever culture you want. You, most organizations have an accidental culture. They've delegated it to HR, and most people aren't listening anyway, and so it's just, it is what it is, right? And you're going to get some results. 10x, you know, I mean, 10% growth, maybe 17% growth. But if you want to 3x, 4x, significantly grow, have that transformative growth, you need to pay attention to culture. So now I'm talking to you all, the culture believers. Those of you who know that there's something to culture, you feel passionately about this, right? Because strategy is just a piece of paper until people in your company do something about it, right? The problem is with a lot of the culture believers is they're thinking that culture is about making people happy. They think, if only people liked working here, then 
we would have great culture. And then they measure culture by measuring if people like working there. And when you think that that's what culture is, the solutions that you throw at culture are solutions that make people happy, that have nothing to do with business results. And that looks like ping pong tables in the lobby and happy hours on Thursday. And this is true. I had one CEO that I was supporting, this is post COVID, who read a book about the power of sleep and had mandatory nap time for everyone at the company from two to three. It was a virtual environment. From two to three, no meetings allowed. Everybody has to take a nap. I take my naps at 10 a.m., by the way. I was like, what? This is like two o'clock? Like, we're almost done. This guy was squirrel leadership. You know, when the leader reads a book and suddenly it's like, squirrel, we're going to do it this way now. Don't do that. So these are not culture solutions. They have nothing to do with culture. These are like interesting perks, fun things. They might make your team happy, but they're not going to drive business results. The most common culture solution that people lean on is the famed leadership retreat. We're going to get everyone together in Napa. We're going to spend $50,000. We're going to take hot air balloon rides. We're going to have the drinks. And by the way, we're going to do Myers-Briggs. <laughs> Or no, DISC. Oh no, StrengthsFinder. Oh no, whatever, you know? And then you're going to understand the kind of special snowflake that you are, and I'm going to understand the kind of special snowflake that I am, and we're going to communicate about our special snowflakeness, and then um, something, something results. Profit, right? <laughs> no, no. That's not culture either. That's fun. I like that. I'm literally certified in Myers Briggs, so, you know, thank you, Gallup, for that. But it's not what drives results. What that drives is a three day high. You go back and you're like, we had a hot air balloon ride, and I'm, I'm an ENT. What was that? You can't remember by day two, right? Because it's so complicated. At least with DISC, you're like, I'm yellow. I got it, yellow. So you culture believers are like, I believe it, but I can't get anyone else to believe it because culture isn't working. Imagine that. You're throwing whiskey at the problem and it's not working. <laughs> so let me tell you what does work, okay? You're going to learn how to drive culture that gets results by the next, you know, I got 16 minutes left, and here we are. The key to an adaptive culture, the key to any culture, is a model called the results pyramid. And this results pyramid is so simple and it's so commonsensical that you will remember it forever. So that is the gift that I give to you, okay? At the top of the results pyramid is what? Results, thank you. We got logic in the room. Because results is what we're looking for. We're in the business of business, so we want to get results. We don't want to get happy feely. We don't want to get touchy feely. We don't want to get woo woo. We don't want to get any of that other stuff. We want to get results, correct? We can get excited about results, right? Okay, so what drives results in your business? Action, thank you. It's the stuff that people do, right? So your people take action, and that's going to drive a result. Now, does every action lead to a result? No. So if I show up at work tomorrow and I sleep all day, did the company get a result? The company got a result. It wasn't the result that they were looking for, necessarily, but that is a result. If I go dark, That's a result, right? I took an action, which was, I'm going to completely check out of this job mentally. I'm going to do the bare minimum so that you don't fire me. I'm going to bait off your radar, and you're going to think that I'm still doing great. Side note, this is true. A year later, I had my second performance review, and she said, you're doing so great, Jessica. Thank you so much for taking the feedback. We really love working with you. So, it's still a mystery. I have no idea what happened there. Meanwhile, I was on year two of my doctoral degree and she had no idea. So, this, this is where the results pyramid starts and it's where most leaders end. This is the full thinking that most leaders do. And this is called the action trap. You do not want to get stuck in the action trap, okay? So, what does the action trap look like? We want to make $50 billion. That's the result we want to achieve. Does that sound good? 
great. Okay, let's take an action. What action should we take? Um, oh, I know. We need to reorganize the organization. Let's restructure. Sounds good. Okay, go back over here. Did we make $50 million? Not yet. Okay, go back over here. Oh, I know. Invest in technology. That sounds good. Let's invest in technology. That's an action. Come back over here. Do we make $50 billion? Still not yet. Hmm. Okay, let's go back over here. We need to train everyone. We need to train everyone, do a bunch of learning and development, maybe hire people, fire people. Let's go back over here. Do we make $50 billion? Yes, we made $50 billion. Fantastic. Well done. Is it over? No, now we need to make $55 billion. Okay, back over here. What are we gonna do? Next action, you come back over here. Do we get the result? It's a never ending cycle. It's the rat race of business. It's what most leaders get stuck in. So you're gonna get a whole bunch of ideas in the next two days about how to become this future company that you're trying to be. And the task that you're going to have is to not get stuck in the action trap. Don't get stuck in, what should we do? Will that get us the result? What should we do? Will that get us the result? You have to go deeper. So, what drives people's actions? It's the beliefs. The beliefs that they have are what's going to drive the action. If your leaders all have the belief that if I bust silos, I'm gonna lose power, they're not gonna do it. They're just not going to do it because we are human beings and we're having a human experience and it's largely fear-based, okay? So I don't want to lose power. I don't want to lose money. I don't want to get fired. I want to do good for myself, right? So you have to instill the beliefs that will be necessary for people to want to take the action to bust silos in order for the company to get results. So you have to measure good leadership by getting results that benefit the organization as a whole. And then you as the leader have to figure out how you can instill beliefs on the team that will get you there. Now, how do beliefs get adopted? What drives your beliefs? It's the experiences. The key to an adaptive culture, an intentional culture creating to drive results, the top of the pyramid, is being really intentional about the experiences you're creating that will drive the beliefs necessary for people to take proactive action so that you can get those results from them. Otherwise, you're in the action trap, you're just micromanaging people's activity all day long, and it leads to burnout, and it leads to panic. So the definition of culture that I want you to sear into your brains when you go back so that you can actually leverage culture to drive results, culture is the way that people think and act to get results. Simple. Not the norms and the, you know, values and the, bleh, all of these definitions. Just how people think and act to get results. And we all know about results. We want to get results. We want to get customer satisfaction. We want to attract talent. We want to get revenue, EBITDA, bleh, right? And we all know about actions. We're going to restructure. We're going to get in te technology implemented. We're going to have a steering committee. <laughs> how many steering committees have you been a part of? All of these are actions, but what are you doing as a leader to get people to think the way you need them to think, to drive their actions so that you can get results? That's the question you have to ask yourself. So, I work with culture partners. I'm the chief scientist of workplace culture. I lead research and strategy on how culture can be leveraged to drive results. And we have a four-step method. I'm just going to walk you through maybe like steps one and two very briefly because I only got nine minutes left. Step one is aligning around those results, actions, and beliefs. It's the top three layers of that pyramid. You guys have to get clear on what it is you're trying to do. McKinsey did a study that said that 95% of employees do not understand their organization's strategy. If your people have no idea what it is, how on earth are they going to get there? Right? That's step number one. So aligning on the results, actions, and beliefs that are necessary to win. Now, the second is you have to activate that with real experiences, which I'll give you a sneak peek into. Then you accelerate with positive accountability, and then you can assess to optimize. Now, this is a four-step process. I will send you a lot more detail on all four of those steps if you text the word equation to 66866. I'll also give you some of these slides, and I'll give you the original research report from Stanford. So just text this number. 
66866, text the word equation, and I'll send it to you. I'll put this up at the end of the deck, too. If you're still skeptical and you want to see if I win you over in the next eight minutes, then you can wait, and I'll give it to you at the end of this. Now, I'm going to tell you a story about my time at Oracle. Anyone from Oracle here? Woo woo, okay. No woos, just hand raises. Quiet, yes, I am from Oracle. Okay. Well, I was at Oracle too. So I was there from the Taleo acquisition, right? 2012 until about 2020. And I was in the organizational development team, so culture transformation. I was a consultant to executives at Oracle. And this was Sean Price. Sean Price was one of the leaders at Oracle, amazing dude. He was the head of cloud. He came in in 2014, and he was hired by Mark Hurd, reported to Mark Hurd, and was supposed to make us a cloud company. That was his task. Welcome. Make us a cloud company. That was the, the ask. And I was assigned to him. He was my client, which was like, Jackpot, high level profile engagement, can't wait, cool dude. I was very excited. This guy understood the power of culture in driving results. And I know that because he called me on day one. He had already engaged in all of these meetings with customers, with salespeople, to identify what the problems were in the organization. And he called me on day one and said, we're going to need to transform the culture of this business. I need help from organizational development. Can you help me? So I was just on cloud nine. This he presented to me, the list of operating gaps that Oracle had based on his meetings with all these customers and partners, why we are not a cloud company today. These are the problems that he wanted to solve. And he said, the only way we're going to solve this problem is if we create cultural shifts. And the cultural shifts necessary, remember, this was 2014, right? The cultural shifts necessary were how are we going to move from an on-prem, product-centric focus to a cloud, customer-centric focus. This was his task. We got to get everyone not just acting different, thinking different. Because culture is how people think and act to get results. And what we did was step one of those four steps I showed you. We had to align around the results pyramid, the results, the actions, and the beliefs necessary to create that. And we started with purpose. He, got to, he had to get very clear on his purpose. And his purpose was to create a cloud company with non-cloud DNA. He wanted to include the non-cloud DNA part in there so that he was making a statement of humility and transparency, saying, we're not there and we need to get there. At the time, I think 5% of Oracle revenue came from cloud. The vision was to maximize bookings, and this was his culture equation, we called it. It was one slide that we created that he shared with everyone across the board. The key results were goals, metrics that he had for the next year that were going to transform the business to allow us to achieve our vision because we were living our purpose. And so key result number one, we had to get one cloud deal per quarter from every sales rep. They had to sell one deal. If we could do that, that's transformative, right? The second was get 10 signatures. And this was buy-in from the executives at Oracle, the two CEOs, and all of these different business division leaders to the new shared operating model that we all had to buy into. That was the change management element of it. And then three was 100% adoption of Oracle at Oracle, a strategy they're still using to this day. They're constantly talking about Oracle at Oracle, their first and best customer, which I think is pretty brilliant. So these were the strategic anchors that they were leaning into to achieve those key results so they could get their purpose. And the cultural beliefs that they knew they were going to have to live in order to get that was humility, transparency, and flexibility. Now, humility, transparency, and flexibility feels a little woo-woo, right? It feels a little like, oh, we all are in this together, but the humility and the transparency wasn't necessarily showing up in a loving, touchy-feely kind of way. One of the things around transparency was he wanted to tell every single person in consulting, your job will not exist in two years. There were no customer success people at this time at the company, right? All of those consulting people shifted to customer success, and some of them left. And the transparency was, you need to get on board or get out. That was transparency the way that Sean did it. What it was really about was clarity. This is why we're doing it. 
this is how we're doing it, and this is the way that we're doing it. And from this engagement was adopted the culture equation, and it models this results pyramid, right? These are results, these are actions, these are beliefs. Now, was he successful? Wildly successful. So Oracle revenue split back then, 5% of their revenue came from cloud today, 70% of it does, and they had $50 billion last year. I mean, they're doing A-OK, -okay, right? Now, having said that, Sean Price, this is a side note. When you get stuck in the action trap, you're constantly running around trying to make sure everyone is doing everything. It's not like you're either in the action trap or not. Sean Price also got stuck in the action trap, which created a lot of pressure. He, Sean Price actually died just a couple years after joining Oracle, and I don't think it's unrelated. I mean, these executives at these tech companies, they stay up until 3 o'clock in the morning. They're working on things. They're running 100 miles a minute. That kind of pressure will make you insane, and it will make you, he wasn't insane, but it'll make you sick. So we do have to think from a cultural perspective, the beliefs that are necessary, the way that we go about doing the work, at what level can we sustain this over the long term? Now, I asked all of you in that survey beforehand, does everyone know about your results? Does everyone, is everyone aligned on the top results that you're trying to achieve? 50-50-ish. About half of you think everyone is aligned with the results, and half of you are not. Now, if your team's not aligned around the results, how on earth are they going to achieve it? And what's shocking to me, I get surprised every single time, we do consulting with companies across all industries, government, for-profit, and Every single one of these organizations, when you start and you say, are you guys aligned on top results, they'll say, yeah, absolutely. And then what I do is I put them all in separate rooms, like the cops, you know? And we're like, you go in here, you go in here, you go in here. So what's your key result that you're trying to achieve this year? And the CMO will be like, 5% growth. And we're like, great, what about you, CFO? And he's like, 7% growth. And the CEO, what do you think? He's like, 6% growth. You get them all back in a room together and say, none of you said the right same number. You said five, you said six, you said seven. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's because, you know, 5% is our budget and 6% is the stretch goal and 7% is what we told the board. And, you know, those are all the number. <laughs> but there's not actually, if your leadership team isn't even aligned, and way more often than you would imagine, the leadership team is not aligned. I'm going to bet you guys are not aligned. So that's step one. Getting aligned around why are we, what are we trying to accomplish, how are we going to do it, and what is the way we're going to go about doing that. What cultural beliefs do the people need to have in order to do that proactively? And then create your own culture equation. This culture equation has been replicated across many, many businesses. It has the whole narrative of the business in one slide. Simple is better. This is a culture equation for West Pharma. This isn't at the CEO level. This is at the department level. So let's say you're the head of sales or the head of whatever, you can do the culture equation just for your team within the scope of influence that you have. Because your team needs to understand what the goal is for that team, even if you don't have buy-in at the company level. And it will spread. So that's step one. Align around your results, actions, and beliefs necessary to win. The second step is you need to activate real experiences to drive those beliefs. That's foundational to culture. And when I talk about activating real experiences, there's the big, bold experiences, hot air balloon rides to nowhere, right? Or there's the everyday, actionable, simple experiences that you can create right now, every minute. And they are the three most powerful, storytelling, recognition, and feedback. And you can think of one, two, three as the first tool, second tool, and third tool, or you can think of one, two, three as the number of times you need to do those every week. Tell one story, give two pieces of recognition, and three pieces of feedback every week. Better yet, ask for feedback three times a week. And when you do that, don't just say, great job. Tie the feedback to all levels of the pyramid. Say, you did this action, great. That was a demonstration of this cultural belief. And by doing that, you're going to help us achieve our key result of blah, 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 whatever the key result is. Make the implicit explicit. 
Lay it out for people. That's intentional culture creation at work, and that's how you actually move the needle. Then you have to accelerate with positive accountability, and I'll just say this about positive accountability in our most recent State of Culture report. We asked every level in the organization what the, who has or what has the greatest impact on culture. The leaders, shockingly, did not say leaders. Everyone else did, right? <laughs> it starts with you. You have to take accountability for the culture because it is leader-led. We all co-create culture, but ultimately it starts with you. And I'm not talking about who's to blame accountability. I'm talking about thinking of accountability as a personal choice to rise above your circumstances and take the ownership necessary to see it, own it, solve it, do it. There's a great book, The Oz Principle, that was us, about accountability. If you haven't read that book, write, read that book. It's transformative. The role of the leader has evolved. It's a lot less about telling people what to do and a lot more about creating the circumstances for people to do well. And I will leave you with this thought. Your culture is perfect. It's absolutely perfect for the results that you're getting today. So, if you have bigger, better, better results that you want to achieve, new desired results that you want transformative growth for, then you need a new culture. You need new actions, new beliefs, and new experiences that will help develop those results. And you guys, you're at the forefront of it. Imagine what will be possible if you start leveraging that simple framework in your teams to start driving results so that you can be one of those great leaders, the leader that gets results. Thank you so much. If you'd like this information, go ahead and text that number. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Yeah.